The goal of this video is to introduce the notion of average rates of change. We'll start with a concrete example. Here is the population data for the state of Massachusetts as compiled by the U.S. Census Bureau. One question you could ask is at what rate did the population of Massachusetts increase during the 20th century? So we're looking for a rate, a ratio, uh, a change in population divided by a change in time. So we have to identify what it is we want to use in this data. We want the population at the beginning and end of the century, and we'll take that difference, and we will divide by the change in number of years, and we'll notice that the population obviously is, is measured in units of people and time is measured in units of years so when we take the quotient there's a natural unit to use and that is people per year so the answer to our question is 35,438 or so people per year. So it's instructive to look at a graphical interpretation of this calculation so if we plot the data on a graph with years across the horizontal axis and population along the vertical axis, we'll notice that the change in population uh, is as a measure of this vertical displacement and the change in time is this horizontal displacement. So when we calculate the rate, this quotient, we're actually calculating a slope of a segment that connects these two points, these two data points that are relevant to us. And this is a, this is a huge observation and this, this sort of graphical notion that a rate of change is given by a slope is sort of critical to navigating lots of problems in calculus. So let's, let's see the definition of average rate of change of a function. Here's a nice function and suppose we have this interval and a question we could ask, how does f change on this interval? So how do we measure this? Well, in an effort to measure this, we could come up with a definition. And the definition is the average rate of change of f on the interval a to b is defined to equal this quotient, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now, what is it we're calculating? Uh, we're, we're, by the way, the, the colon equals is, is a symbol that means is defined to equal. These aren't equal by accident, they're equal because we say so. We are actually defining the left-hand quantity to be what you get in the right-hand formula. And what is it we're measuring? We're measuring a change in value over a change in argument. So if we look at these two points, f of b minus f of a is once again this vertical displacement and B minus A is measuring this horizontal displacement so we're measuring a change in value over a change in argument and graphically what we're measuring is a rise over run we're measuring the slope of a segment joining those two points so a couple of comments are in order the the order in which you use the endpoints does not matter and this is a consequence of the fact that when you take two numbers and you subtract them in the other order, you're just introducing a sign change. Q minus P is negative P minus Q. So if you attempt to calculate F of A minus F of B over A minus B, you could rewrite both the numerator and the denominator using this fact, and the negative ones cancel. And lo and behold, what you're really saying is that it doesn't matter whether you take A or B first in your calculation. What does matter is that you keep the arguments and values correctly paired so you can't mismatch A and B in this fashion. There are two versions of this formula that are wrong. They're not going to work. They're going to be off by a sign in fact. So either order it doesn't matter as long as you keep the arguments and values paired correctly in your formula. And here's a more conceptual issue. The rate of change, the average rate of change, provides a measure of net change on a specific interval. So you don't want to take too much away from this calculation. It only tells you what it tells you and nothing more. So what do we mean by this? Suppose you have a function and you knew that the average rate of change on a certain interval was negative. Now you might think that somehow the function is forced to basically decrease from one point to this other point, but that's not necessarily the case. You can imagine a function and an interval inside the original interval where the average rate of change is actually positive. So it's this, this average rate of change being negative on an inter interval does not force a conclusion that something 
everything has to have a negative rate of change on the inside of that interval. And there are variations to this theme. You can imagine that you've got an interval on which the rate of change is zero. And you might think that the function therefore has to be roughly constant on the middle, but of course that need not be true. You could imagine a function that varies wildly throughout the interval and yet the average rate of change turns out to be zero in the end. So let's look at a specific example numerically. We've got this fourth degree polynomial function and we're going to use a graphing calculator to find the average rate of change on the following three intervals. Now it might be instructive to get a sense of what these numbers will be so let's take a look at the graph. You've got the interval from 1 to 3 and it's pretty clear that the rate of change on this interval should be 1-ish roughly more or less. Square root of 2 is about 1.4, so negative square root of 2 is about negative 1.4, pi is about 3.1, so you would expect on this interval right here, the average rate of change will still be positive, but certainly less than 1, so somewhere between 0 and 1, we realize that the average rate of change will be there. Um, on the final interval, from about negative 3 to 1.9 or so, we see that in this case, the average rate of change is definitely going to be negative. So let's call it negative one-ish. And we'll, we'll keep this all in mind as we move forward. So now we're going to bring in the graphing calculator. And there are two tricks we're going to use throughout that you need to be familiar with. One is once you do a calculation on the home screen, it's stored in a history. And you can recall it using the keystroke second enter and it'll help you go through the previous 20 or so commands you've done on the home screen so if you want to redo such a calculation or simply edit it because it's very close to what you want you can hit second enter repeatedly and go through your history until you find the calculation you want to edit and another trick is if you've taken the trouble of storing a function into a Y register you should be able to gain access to that register wherever you are not just the Y equals window and you can do that using the keystrokes here. So you go to the variables button and then the submenu y variables function and finally y1. It is a shame that this is buried so deep in the operating system because it's a fundamental object function that you want to have access to. But it's there even if it is a little out of the way and we're going to use it. So here we go. Let's take a look first of all at the function in the decimal window. So we're going to do zoom decimal and we're going to see this familiar graph here that we already have. And now we're going to use trace to find the value at the argument 3 and we find that that's 0.4. But we don't have to use trace, we could do it from the home screen. So here we're going to go to the Y1 register, plug in 3, and we'll find that the function value is 0.4. Now this suggests that we could just calculate the average rate of change right from the home screen. f of 3 minus f of 1 and then we'll divide by the number 3 minus 1, the interval width. And so there is the value 1.1333 so there's your approximate rate of change on that interval and it's about 1-ish as we expected. Now, we'd like to calculate the average rate of change on the interval from negative root 2 to pi. Now, this calculation should look similar, but instead of 3, we want pi, and instead of 1, we want negative square root of 2. So what we've done is we've used second enter to recover this previous calculation, and now we're going to go into it and simply edit it so that it looks the way we want. So we'll go back, we'll change the 3 to a pi, and we'll change the 1 to a negative root 2, and then we have to alter the interval width, of course. So now it's going to be pi minus negative root 2, which is the same as pi plus root 2. So we'll have to get that in there. And when all the dust settles and we hit Enter, we'll have our average rate of change. And we'll notice that this average rate of change, 0.6449 or so, is firmly between 0 and 1, just as we expected. Now, this expression isn't quite as clean as the one we used for the previous interval, and so maybe we should rethink how we do this. So we're going to introduce one more layer of substitution in the picture. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to store 
into their own registers the endpoints. So we're going to take negative square root of 2, store that into a register called A, and we're going to take pi and store it into a register that we'll call B. And we'll think of A and B as the endpoints. So we're going to find the average rate of change on the interval from A to B. Now, when we do this calculation, it's going to look unambiguously correct. We will know when we calculate it. We're looking at this picture and we know that what we're doing is we are calculating the average rate of change of the function y1 on the interval from a to b. There's no doubt in our mind that that's what we've got going. The only issue is do we have a, b, and the function correct? Well we just, we can even see on the screen we've got a and b correct and y1 of course we know is correct. Now the advantage of this is we can change it easily. So suppose we want to do the interval in part C. All we need to do is store the appropriate values of A and B into these registers, which we're doing now. And now we've already got the calculation cooked, so we hit second enter a few times and we can recall the calculation there. And now we'll hit enter and we can redo this rate of change for the interval in C. So there we go. We've got the average rate of change is about negative point 8332 and we expected it to be negative 1-ish. So this all looks good. This is a way to leverage the graphing calculator to do these calculations. So let's take a look now at the population again. So here's a question we could ask. In which of the decades of the 20th century did we see the lowest average growth in population? Now we could look at this graphically. We know that we're looking for a slope. That's what a rate of change is. So if we just imagine what those slopes look like for each of the decades in question, two of them jump out at us because they are the shallowest slopes. So we have two candidates for the lowest growth rate, the 30s and the 70s. It's very obvious graphically. And now what we can do is just go back to the data and figure out what those rates of change are. So the rate of change for the 30s is about uh, almost 7,000 people per year and the rate of change for the 70s turns out to be less than 5,000 so we have a winner it's the 70s the 70s saw the most sluggish growth in population for Massachusetts let's look at uh, an example from science and this example shows you that time does not need to be in the picture so to speak so we're gonna look at the atmospheric pressure through the troposphere and the troposphere extends up to about 36,000 feet so we're looking at the lowest 36,000 feet of the atmosphere and the pressure decreases as you go up in altitude and the model for this looks something like this and now we don't have a particular goal in mind we're just gonna make some observations and we're going to use average rates of change to do so so the altitudes measured in feet pressures measured in pounds per square foot which means when we calculate a rate of change we're going to be calculating changes in pressure divided by change in altitude and the, and the units for those will be pounds per square foot per foot and technically that's pounds per cubic feet but um, we're going to keep it as pounds per square foot per foot so here's what we can do we're looking at this graph we want to find some rates of change we don't we, we just want to be sensible about this we don't want to get too fancy so what we'll do is we'll notice some points on the graph that are relatively easy to calculate so for example here's a segment it's very easy to calculate the slope of this segment roughly it's about negative 200 over 4000 so we've got that slope there we can pick out similarly uh, a segment here and perhaps another one over here Again, these have been cherry-picked because they seem to go very close to a nice grid point so we can do the calculation easily. Now, why bother with this? Well, this enables us to say some things that are, you know, relatively intelligent and relevant to pressure and altitude. So, for example, the first calculation could be translated into the following statement. Near the surface of the Earth, the pressure decreases at a rate of approximately 0.067 pounds per square foot per foot. Similarly, the second calculation could allow us to say reasonably that around 15,000 feet pressure decreases at a rate of approximately 0.05 pounds per square foot per foot. And finally, near the top of the troposphere, pressure decreases at a rate of approximately 0.025 pounds per square foot per foot. So we're going to end with this 
somewhat sophisticated problem here. So find the exact value of k for which the average rate of change of the function x squared on the interval from negative 1 to k is equal to 3 fifths. Now this looks a little ferocious, but it's really not that bad if you just follow through on what your definitions are. The first thing we'll notice is interval notation implicitly assumes that you've got the left-hand endpoint and the right-hand endpoint listed in that order, so k has to be to the right of negative 1. So without saying so, the problem's really demanded that k be greater than negative 1. But you know what? That's no loss anyway for this function because if you look at it, any choice of k to the left of negative 1 is going to create an interval on which the average rate of change is obviously negative, so you weren't going to find any rate of change taking k to the left of negative 1 that was going to be 3 fifths. It wasn't even going to be positive, so that's really no loss. It's not that big a deal. But we are looking for something on the right of negative 1. Now, we know there's going to be a solution. I mean, we know that because if we drew a line with slope 3 fifths through the point negative 1, 1, you can see the point you need for the interval to have an average rate of change equal to 3 fifths. And you know there can only be one solution because you know what the graph of x squared looks like. So we know that whatever comes out of this, there's got to be one and only one solution. So how do we go about solving this? So just one, one strategy is just to write out our goal. Our goal literally is to find the average rate of change on this interval from negative 1 to k, and we want it to be 3 fifths. And now what's our definition of rate of change? You plug in these endpoints to your formula. That literally is the rate of change of f on the interval from negative 1 to k, and we need it to be 3 fifths. What, what function are we dealing with? It's the squaring function. So f of k is k squared, f of negative 1 is 1, and then the denominator, k minus negative 1, that's actually k plus 1. So now we have an equation, and we can solve this equation. now. You could easily multiply both sides by 5 and k plus 1, and you'd get a quadratic, which you could simplify, and hopefully you'd notice that that factors. You, would, you don't need the quadratic formula. And you would get candidates 8 fifths and negative 1. Negative 1's out of the picture. We decided we needed to be bigger than negative 1, and so 8 fifths is our solution. That's all perfectly fine, but perhaps we should go back to this equation and think of it in a slightly stronger fashion, something with a little more um, thought. Um, the numerator factors. It factors into k minus 1, k plus 1. And an observation we should have made right up front is negative 1 was going to make the left-hand side blow up anyway. K negative, negative 1 was ruled out right from the beginning from our expression, so that wasn't allowed. And since it's not negative 1, these factors are equal and we can divide them out. So actually, if we had just thought about it a moment, we would have come up with an equation which is actually even much simpler than the quadratic. k has to be 3 fifths plus 1, and that's our 8 fifths. And you'll notice that in the solution, in the picture above, that solution looks pretty reasonable. 8 fifths looks to be about right.